Beautification of communication, the communification podcast. Hi, Kimmy. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the show. Hello, Hi. Malika. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. I, I thought of having the two of you on, by the way, have you ever met? Do you know each other or of each other? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not until you um, told me that she was also going to be a guest. I was like, oh, I should, I should know who this is. And so I went and I looked at um, your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. We have never met before, but pleasure to have a conversation with you. <laughs> oh, I love this. And we'll all get to know each other better today, along with all of our wis- listeners. And I just think each of you is perfect for this discussion about collective action. That's when a number of people work together to achieve some common objective. And each of you encourages, motivates, inspires that type of pro-social collective action in your own ways. And I love seeing it on social media. And I can't wait to hear your perspectives, especially after our exposure to some of the research and the academic side through Dr. Hawkins episode on the pod. So before we dig in, I'm going to do a brief recap of some of the things that were discussed. So we were introduced to SIMCA or the social identity model of collective action, where identity, injustice, and efficacy were identified as the three motivators that lead people to participate in collective actions. He mentioned some ways that people use social media for collective action. So like online petitions, raising funds, providing links and information, facilitating connection between people. Of course, like liking, posting, sharing, commenting are also seen as collective actions in some instances and encouraging offline actions as well. He introduced us to some benefits and pitfalls of using social media for collective action. We talked about the echo chamber, for example, uh, content moderation, the algorithm, the spiral of silence, and that notion of slacktivism. So there was a lot. (laughs) My first question for each of you, and Melissa, we'll have you kick us off first. So what was your initial reaction to what you heard from Dr. Hawkins? Like, did anything stand out? A lot of things actually really stood out because I felt like it related to me a lot. Um, it also, it felt like I was being read in a way. Like I was like, wow, the whole Simca model with like people feel really called to collective action when um, identity or I, their identity being threatened is involved. And for me, like me coming into creating content on TikTok really came, was sparked out of my identity as a native Hawaiian and seeing things being misrepresented or being taught incorrectly by people that aren't from here, you know? And so, yeah, a lot of those things really resonated with me and it felt like I was like being, I don't know, like called out or not called out, but just being read in a way, you know? And and I was just like, oh, this is really interesting. Called in. Yeah, Mm. yeah. (laughs) What about you, Kimmy? I just found it all very interesting. Um, And I think the slacktivism is something that stood out to me because I think that, you know, as we all just engage so much in social media, and I think especially when you cultivate like a strong voice on it, um, it can be really easy to feel like you're doing good work by just these little clicks. And I'm not saying that you're not, but I think that that's, that was a good call out or call in that I, I feel like I, it circulates in my mind a lot is that um, I don't ever want to have that replace the real on the ground grassroots stuff that I feel like activism is built on or that change is built on. And sometimes when you do have a presence on social media, it can be so easy to be like, type, 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 click. I did my part. I'm done, you know? And I just think that's like, mm, like, I don't, that scares me to think of um, that being the call to action as a society. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. a really good reminder for all of us, right? But also Dr. Hawkins was, was talking about how 
COVID, you know, it's contextual because the last two years we really couldn't do that in person the way that we used to. And so now is maybe the perfect time for this episode and to be called back in to <laughs> learning about slacktivism and what that is and how we can combat it and, and right. really, you know, do a little of both as he was saying. Well, before we go deeper, we're going to rewind a bit. So each of you, could you please share with our listeners what you do on social media the values that you live by, because I really feel like for each of you, they come through super strong and how you have used social media to encourage collective actions in your own way. So maybe Kimmy, you can go first this time. Okay. And I'll start with a big disclaimer that I try not to take my social media too seriously. Um, I really don't have like a package, like this is what you know, this is what this channel will be always feeding you with values or anything like that, because uh, I don't know why the reason is, I think because I don't like that type of pressure. And if it's not spontaneous and real and raw and fun, I lose interest quickly. So with that being said, I don't, um, I don't try to take it too seriously, but I will just say that when it comes to what my passions are, which are probably what comes through in um, in social media the most. My passions are our food and and really sourcing it um, the best way I know how to, knowing where food comes from and um, sharing the stories behind it. Um, sharing like whether it's sharing food or sharing stories, all of those things, and lately, one hundred percent family. I love that. You've made like hunting, gathering, sustainability, gardening, trading of goods and services. You've made it cool. <laughs> and I love <laughs> and I love how um I remember particularly one instance of the reef safe sunscreen and and also you talking about microplastics, you know. So I know you're you're saying that you don't take it very seriously and don't really, you know, you're not like pushing values on people, but what happens is by being real and authentic, you 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 do that organically. You show people your values of food and family and sharing and sustainability and that inspires them inherently and so um don't feel pressure but just know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> that was much better said. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, what about you, Melissa? Um, so for me, me coming into social media as anything other than like a user as a creator, I guess, in a way, which is still like kind of weird for me to fathom. Um, I really push to help spread Hawaii Ike and try and reinvigorate our younger um, generations that, hey, like our mo'olelo, our ka'au, our mo'oku'oho, our o'olelo is very important, is very interesting and there's an interest in it to um to awamo to carry on that koleana as hanaunaho to carry on that koleana as future generations um as well as a lot of where i think i gained like a lot of followers is me essentially calling out creators that were spreading misinformation about hawaii or spreading um, false stereotypes or harmful stereotypes to us as a community of people as indigenous people um, you know so like things like luau's like or fakey luau's with plastic flowers or appropriating hula or things like that is also sort of what I do on social media I like to share a lot of resources to learn um, I have a whole google drive of pdfs full of Hawaiian history books and resources in my um, link tree and um, I think a value that I try, I hope I try to embody in my social media presence is a'ohepauka ike, which is essentially like knowledge isn't only gained, a'ohepauka ike ikahala ho'okahi, knowledge isn't gained in one space. So I always try and like reiterate in the diff on my different platforms, like, you know, like don't only take it from me. I don't feel, I'm not a kumu to you. I'm just trying to provide resources or you know, break down things into short one minute, three minute videos that people can, you know, catch on to or, you know, just knowledge isn't lear learned from just one place and it's never ending. Yeah. And Dr. Hawkins, um, he reflected that in his research based strategies when he said, mm -hmm. you know, we really have to 
be media literate and think critically and mm -hmm. think critically about who you believe and why and, and do those things. So I, I love that. And when I look at your TikTok and the things that you share, I love that a lot of what you share, you do, you have resources, like you are literally linking back to academic resources and things that people can then go and you have your link tree which I have right here <laughs> I have never seen a link tree like this in my life oh my gosh you have put so much work into this I have to scroll like seven times to get through Melissa's link tree <laughs> there are resources um, from everything from anti-racism resources Palestine um, we've got Mauna Kea We've got donating to, you know, different Aloha Aina movements and the COVID crisis and, um, you know, Aina Momona, Hawaii Food Bank, signing of petitions. Um, you know, when you speak about something that is of value to you and that you want to inform people on, you give them that extra step that they can take to then go learn more. It's not just saying, mm -hmm. go learn more. It's like, here, let me give you some resources. And then you can also, you know, do it on your own. I encourage that. So I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay, so let's move on. So we've got the Simca model. This is, this was the first thing that he taught us. And the Simca model is that academic explanation of things that help determine if somebody is going to go out and actually participate in a collect collective action. So I want to know if this is in alignment with your own personal experiences. I can think of one myself. Um, there was this incident that happened during a telethon for the Hawaii Food Bank. You're probably both familiar with this. Mm -hmm. It was a popular local musician mm -hmm. sharing her story about food poverty. And unfortunately, the comedians slash hosts of this portion of the event took her trauma. And, you know, if you ask a majority of the people who heard what happened, these guys basically made jokes that were unnecessary, in bad taste and plain in inappropriate, you know, to say the least. And social media did a few things. So first they went viral. So it did just people were exposed to this on a level that they probably would not have been had it not been for social media. And all it took was for a few people to identify with her, to feel like there was an injustice that occurred and that they might be able to do something about it, right? That efficacy. So those three pillars of the Simca model and people started to donate money to the food banks here in Hawaii. I got involved because one of my followers reached out to me and she said, with your platform, would you be willing to let people know that I will match $10,000 of donations to the Maui Food Bank? So all of a sudden it became this movement. And in the end, between I think 50K and 80K was raised total for the Hawaii and Maui Food Banks, which was so amazing. And, and that was completely organic and, and, and just happened. Right. Um, so do either of you have an experience to share with like a particular message that like kind of went viral or something that you, you know, you felt strongly about. And so you went and took action and that motivated people to, I know that people slide into our DMS all the time to say really nice things, <laughs> you know, about, um, thank you for teaching me about this, or I never knew that. And now I'm doing this, like I am taking action. So maybe you guys can chime in on how your personal experience fits into the Simca model of motivation to participate. I have a couple of different stories, um, that come to mind when you talk about that. Um, one is definitely regarding microplastics in the ocean. I did, um, this video called finding a way and um and it was about and i it wasn't the first video i did about microplastics in the ocean but it's such such a hard topic to get people interested in because everyone's looking for this huge like garbage patch of you know this floating state of texas to go clean up or whatever and um and the problem is just so much worse than that it really is like the smog of just microplastic particles in our ocean contaminating it and um but it's a really hard thing to make content about because it's just not one of those like everyone wants that shock value imagery and um but i did this i was part of this video called finding a way and um and there were just some 
some really vulnerable open talking that I did about how how it makes me feel and how I feel and um and I did not think it was going to go anywhere but um but same it, it went viral it just took a few people and then you know once people with really huge following start reposting it or quoting it it just went everywhere and um and it just I just feel like more than anything, I think it just activated a lot of minds when it comes to thinking more about the plastic pollution in the ocean and understanding that it is not a cleanup issue, but it's something that has to be stopped at the source when it comes to what we use every day. And so I just think it, if anything, it was a collective thing that helped people connect the dots in a way that took me years myself to understand. Um, but once I was able to verbalize it and that started getting passed around, I think it caught on a lot more quickly. Um, the second time was um, I had this Na National Geographic series that, um, that did not air in North America, but um, it aired in like 70 other different countries in the world. And um, so nobody's familiar with it here, but one of the episodes that we did, I stayed with this beautiful family in the jungle of Malaysia who are just doing permaculture and so many great things with their land there. And, um, and so years after this, you know, Nat Geo series came and went, um, the family contacted me and they just said, you know, the government is taking away the lease on our land and they're going to, you know, give this rainforest that we were living on for logging and everything is going to be destroyed. And we have this petition. Um, and the only reason why we have it is because of the Nat Geo series. But is there anything you can do to help? I posted about that. And again, I'm posting to an audience who has never seen this family. They have no way of watching these episodes, but just spoke from my heart. And within no time, that petition was so full that, um, that the same like Malaysian government officials who are taking away the land came and like had to get all the photo offs of like shaking their hand and like giving the land back and stuff. And so that was like a crazy moment where it's like, how the heck, you know, did that just lead to this? But um, that was crazy. That was insane. <laughs> Chicken skin moment for sure. Yeah. Wow. I, I love both of those examples. Melissa, I'm sure you also have your fair share. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was trying to think of examples and I was like, there's a lot of my videos that went viral, but uh, like, you know, so one of them, I think uh, a lot of what I used to do more so, but still speak on now is just the displacement of Native Hawaiians from Hawaii, right? And um, so a lot of my videos back when COVID, well, you know, in the height of COVID and a lot of people just coming here to Hawaii for vacations and, you know, while, you know, people are moving out of Hawaii because COVID really messed them up, they lost their jobs, they couldn't afford their homes, housing sky, uh, housing prices and skyrocketed and food prices skyrocketed. Um, I made some videos, basically stitching creators and explaining like, you know, like saying, hey, this is not okay. I'm a Native Hawaiian and this is why. I gave all the data about, you know, how Native Hawaiians make up essentially only less than 15% of Hawaii's population, according to the census. However, we make up more than 50% of our homeless population. Um, how Native Hawaiians have to work more than, you know, work two, three jobs in one household just to stay afloat. And we're still, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. And a lot of those videos got upwards of, they got a lot of views. And I also, at the same time, you know, provided resources, petitions, um, it helped to raise a lot of awareness. Um, and a lot of people were like, hey, wow, I really didn't know this. And I really didn't know how harmful, of an, harmful of an effect that tourism has um, on Native Hawaiians on the local community. A lot of people have told me like, you know what, I decided that I'm not going to visit Hawaii until things get better for the local communities for the Native Hawaiian communities, especially, um, which isn't it isn't as big as an of an impact I think like as give me your story about that family not losing their land in um in Malaysia and but but that's, that's a very rare that... specific thing that's a very <laughs> rare specific thing and I I just have to say like 
that's the only thing I could think of that actually had a measurable impact the same way Malika's mm -hmm. did. But I absolutely believe 100% that the indirect like waves that are coming off mm -hmm. of what you're doing, like just because you can't sum it all up and measure it doesn't mean that yeah. it's not just as valuable. Yeah. But absolutely. sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So like on one hand, it's that a lot, I think is what to me has a really great impact is like getting people outside of Hawaii aware of what's happening to us and more conscious of their impact that they have that, you know, some people will think I'm one person, I'm just visiting Hawaii, I'm going to have a good time, whatever. And it's really like, no, because when you add up, you know, the pollution that you cause for your travel here on an airplane, when you add up the pollution that you cause, you know, when you're traveling with cars, and then on top of that, the waste that you produce and the waste that you're forcing onto our infrastructures that cannot handle it we are overpopulated we don't have the infrastructure we need medically um you know waste water to support more people coming here just to have fun and we barely have enough to support us now or we're remote islands where we have limited resources natural resources and things are getting destroyed um one other thing i think um is also when people go, when tourists go on hikes like the Ha'iku Stairs up on O'ahu, um, which is an illegal trail, um, on that trail is actually um, a species of endemic plant that there's only a handful of left in Hawaii, in the world, essentially. Um, and so I made a video because somebody's video went viral, had millions of views and everybody was like, oh my God, where is this? I wanna go there. Mail, mail, mail. Um, so I made a video stitching and explaining why going on these hikes might not be a good idea. And it, well, first of all, because it's illegal, you know, it's state property, it's government property. And the, you know, if you go on it, it's trespassing. Sure, it's beautiful. And I would love to go there. I would love to hike that and see that. But I, as a Native Hawaiian, like, would not do that because of the impact that I would have. There's there, I showed a picture of what it was 10 years ago and how it has eroded now due to the high traffic, high foot traffic from um, tourists and locals as well, you know, visiting this area and that impact that it has to, to where how we could lose an entire species of plant that was only found here. And to me, a lot of like, I really care as a Hawaiian, like I really care about our endemic species of manu, of, you know, plants and things that could only be found here and have only grown here. Just like, you know, to me, it's, really related to us as Hawaiians, you know, like we were here and, you know, we're being pushed out by invasives in a way. And just like, you know, our wildlife, our plant life. So I made a video just talking about all of these things, all of this, how this impacts that area negatively and us as a whole negatively. And that went viral. And a lot of people became aware like, hey, and then so now when I go across and see people's haiku stairs, hikes, you know, romanticizing these places, I see comments full of like, this is illegal, this is not okay, you know, things like that. And also, yeah, so which is I was like, okay, hey, it spreads awareness, this is really awesome, all these things that I've spoken about and gave, you know, actual factual information and not just being like an angry, angry person, like, hey, don't go there. like, that's not okay, you're pissing mm -hmm. us off, which, you know, which is all valid, I think, like, you can be a local and say, no, no, go there. you don't need to go to this place where are you from anyway california go california yeah but like which is valid to me but i break things down so it's like hey this is what it is these are the facts this is what you do this is what you are doing there you know like this mm -hmm. is what it is and some people still aren't gonna listen of course but you know any small way any big way that i can impact something or at least spread awareness on these things um is a win yeah yeah, I think, um, you know, going back to the Simca model, like people ca can identify as like, I want to be a good person that protects the land, you know, and then they can see that they have the efficacy, they can actually take those steps to not go on the haiku stairs, you know, so mm -hmm. there, and that 
that maybe there's an injustice there that people are doing it and trampling on this thing. It could die and never be here for future generations. Mm -hmm. And that's terrible, right? So we can kind of, uh, this is what I love about bringing you two in and then also having kind mm -hmm. of the academia side, because we can see how each of these examples really kind of fits into that. And you can see why people were motivated and to, you know, Kimmy's point of like, well, it, it's difficult to measure, right? But mm -hmm. Um, people are sharing your thoughts and when they share it, then someone else sees it and they share it. And so this information is getting out there and you might not, you have, we have no idea mm -hmm. <laughs> the extent to which our thoughts and ideas are impacting others. And we do get a little bit of an idea because people will DM us or tell us this, or you'll see the comments kind of regurgitating like your information. Oh, good. That actually went through like this person <laughs> got it. Um, but your voice matters. I think that was like the quote of Dr. Hawkins interview was like, mm -hmm. your voice matters. It does. Even if you don't see like the measurable stuff. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll move on because I know we're, we're going to wrap up here soon. Um, so personally, I was struck by the discussion on the spiral of silence. So that's the idea mm -hmm. that people might be fearful of expressing their opinions, or even that the algorithm can work against you and silence you by not putting your content in front of people. So thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I actually have a lot of examples of this, unfortunately. Um, it's a really big issue on TikTok, like which is the platform I think I'm mainly based off of. Um, I've had many videos removed and what the notification that I got was, it was like, oh, violates community guidelines for child safety. The video that I posted was me eating an ulu with the, like, you know, putting the mo'olelo about how ulu came to be, you know, the Hawaiian mo'olelo. And I was like, there's no way this is, you know, minor safety. This is not a minor safety issue. I wasn't dressed indecently. I was wearing a pareo. Um, you know, everything was covered. I didn't have anything behind me. I wasn't like cutting it with a knife, like dangerously or anything like that. I had a video like that taken down. I've had many videos just taken down, probably reported. And, um, and there, it was nothing. All of my, all of my, most of my TikToks at least are me spreading Hawaii or just me trying to put out my mana or my um, perspective as you know a Hawaiian um, or things like that and just these things would be taken down and I never you know I don't get notified if it's because somebody reported it or if TikTok just took it down okay also something that I noticed was um, sometimes I would be afraid to put out a video because some of my viral videos, they would go out. Like there was one where I reacted to an old interview with Jennifer Lawrence when they filmed here for one of the Hunger Games videos. And she made a really insensitive comment about, you know, they had a Native Hawaiian culture practitioner or advisor when they were filming. Um, I forget where it was, but somewhere where, you know, it was, it's a sacred area. It's on Oahu. Um, it's one of the ranches. However, but anyway, she was talking about how like, oh yeah, they told us not to sit on the rocks because they're like, I don't know, ancestors or something, you know, ha ha ha. But then I sat on it and, you know, put my butt on it, this, this and that. And like that wow. like triggered me. Yeah, it was in, it was an old one. So I, me, I was reacting to this and posting it to TikTok, like, you know, a few years later, but it still has that impact. Like to me as a Hawaiian that like, you know, that practices my culture, that believes in my culture, that teaches my culture actively through the work that I do. Um, you know, I saw that and that made me really upset because especially if Keiki, like, especially for the Keiki that see this, the, like the Keiki that I teach at the school that I work at, like, they're going to feel like hurt because she was basically brushing it off as our beliefs, our culture is ridiculous, you know? So I posted that video and like, it ended up getting flooded with comments from people that didn't follow me and just saying, oh my God, they're just rocks. Like you're being, you're being ridiculous you're being over dramatic it's not that big of a deal oh can you believe like I can't believe people really worship rocks or think rocks are their ancestors and that you know like after that instance sometimes I pull back or refrain from talking more about or trying to teach more on TikTok about our culture or our beliefs or you know things like that because I'm like I don't want to hear that like obviously that didn't change my mana or that didn't change my viewpoint of things but I don't want Keiki seeing that because I know that Keiki follow me and I know that they can see my my content if they wanted to comment like to 
support what I did and they see it flooded with all these negative comments, like it's harmful. So sometimes I think about like, you know, like if I post this and there's all these negative comments, what is the real impact? Sure, I can ho'olaha or like spread information about something, but if a keiki goes into my comments and sees something like this and they get hurt or they get offended or even like, God forbid, they, you know, pull back and think, you know what, I'm not going to do something like this. Or maybe I should pull back from my cultural, my cultural practices and beliefs because I could be humiliated or ashamed like this girl is on, like this auntie mm-hmm. is on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah, like you don't want to be subject to the negativity, right? Mm-hmm. What about you, Kimmy? very very similar feelings um like I haven't had anything like I don't think I've had anything removed maybe one video in Papua New Guinea because there is nipples um but um but but I would say I'm more effect I was more affected by exactly what Melissa just described where you know like I believe in in what what I eat, what I feed my child, but not everybody um, wants to see like dead animals. And, um, and it it definitely, especially um, years ago, would stir up like, oh my gosh, some of the most hateful things that you could say to a human being, you know, like, you should just die. I hope that you get shot in the head instead of that fish or, you know, how dare you? And just like so many, so much hate coming in towards something that, um, that I truly believe in and try my best to be absolutely like thoughtful about. And, um, And it means so much to me that I think that when all this hate would just spew through, um, yeah, it definitely makes it hard and makes you think twice about, you know, about how much you want to put yourself out there. It doesn't change how you feel, how I feel about it, but, but it just becomes very clear. I think the more that you post, the more that you see, like, this is an easy, popular thing to do. This is a very easy way where everyone's going to like it. Everyone's going to be happy. And this type of post like will go over well. This one, which might mean just as much to me or even more to me, is just not going to be popular. And this one, which might mean the most to me, is probably going to stir up a bunch of negativity. Um, and so that becomes that becomes a grueling place to to be when you're making a decision and and sometimes you know sometimes you do fall into silence because sometimes your own body and spirit can only handle so much we're not I don't think built to be like necessarily be getting punched in the face every single day of our lives you know and um but there's other times where you wake up a little spunky and you're just like the hell with it this is how I feel this is what I believe Mm -hmm. in and I'm going to do this, you know? And so I think that's also why I said my disclaimer in the beginning of like, I try not to take it too seriously. And I try not yeah. to like yeah. um, say like, this is what I'm delivering is because it's going to be different every single day because I'm a human being with real mm-hmm. feelings. And, um, right. and that, that is something I feel like I, I definitely had to kind of, kind of go through. Um, but I will say that in the early days, I kind of, I kind of would duke it out. Like I would get so offended when people would say things and then I'd go look at their profile (laughs) and they're eating McDonald's and whatever, you know, and and I I would just be like, okay, I will spend all day responding to every single comment because I have something to say (laughs) about everything. So that's how much I care. And, and I spent way too much energy doing that and a lot of times as it's all back to what Melissa was saying a lot of times it wasn't in the most um break it down way it was in a way of like you're ignorant like (laughs) go eat your pork rinds and think of go eat your pork rinds Meg and think about it you know and um, it was there's like like an emotional response in there totally 
and I'd end up wasting so much energy fighting with people. Um, but then it got to a point where I had to ask myself like, okay, Kimmy, like, yes, they might be ignorant. Yes. Maybe you can just smash them by, by fighting back or whatever, but maybe you're a little ignorant too. And I had to like check myself and say, you know, I was raised in a way where in my very, very early years, like my family literally did live off the ocean and the land. So I was raised in a way where I knew exactly where my food was coming from, where I was taught to like respect that that takes care of us and, and understand like this, you know, but that's not how most people were raised. And, you know, and if I was just raised like, in a totally different way of being brought up um, and not understanding this connection and connecting the dots. But I have maybe some sort of like feeling in my heart that I want to be connected to nature, that I want to be connected to these animals and to these plants and whatever, but I don't really have that connection because I wasn't raised that way. Um, I could be eating my McDonald's and then see a picture of a girl with a spear and a dead fish and say, bad guy but that could really even though it's ignorant it could be coming from the same place it could be coming from the same place that we are we are not we are a part of nature it's not like man and the ecosystem like like we are and because I think the more disconnected you become to that the more civilized you know you are and the less connection that you have I think sometimes these knee-jerk reactions just come out in really weird ways because your soul does want to connect to something and doesn't know how and so gets all you know riled up when they see something that they're so they think they're supposed to be against and so then I had to ask myself like what do you care more about your ego and the fact that someone's attacking you or do you care more about this movement you know because if you truly care more about this movement you shouldn't be bashing that person telling them to go eat their pork rinds and, and, you know, I won't swear, but whatever. <laughs> um, you should be trying to bring them in. And so then I started really being like, even no matter how horrible what they said was, I would literally, I'd have to like shake it off, but then I would come back and I would say, well, thank you so much for, you know, for caring about the environment and the natural world or whatever it is. Um, I really appreciate that you do. And I do too. And this is why, you know, this is why I do what I do. And this is the meaning that it brings to my plate. And I would love to learn about, you know, how you feel about your own plate or whatever, whatever it was. And I would, it was crazy though, because the minute I started operating from that level, it not only would just disarm the person, but it was like, it was crazy because I think half the times they were calling me like a savage or a, you know, a disrespectful person. And then when I would respond with such respect and really try and put the movement first, not my feelings first, but the movement first, mm -hmm. um, that was, that was something that I think was felt and that was read. And the majority of times I would get a lengthy apology and a thank you for explaining this to me. And, um, and what was really neat is, um, and just like, you know, how you said, when it comes to, when you read the comments, when you see people hiking up haiku stairs, like how people are now educating, that's what I saw happening after that is when I was responding with my two fists up, you know, my followers would respond that way too. Mm -hmm. When I started breaking it down to people in this super respectful way, putting the movement first, half the times when I would get a negative comment, I'd be like, oh, I'll get back to this later, you know, after I shake off the vibes. Yeah. Um, and then I come back and I wouldn't even have to touch it because there'd be seven people already approaching it in this thoughtful, beautiful, mm -hmm. like such good communication way. And it would get resolved and I could just step back. And and I will say like, I don't even, I'm sure it's not done forever, but I feel like I don't even really have to mm -hmm. hardly do that anymore. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool.
Well, you yeah. know who you are and you're coming from your values, your soul, like you're just being authentic. And so even for yourself, when you're reflecting on it, it's so much easier to get through, right? Because you're like, well, this is me. And if, you know, you don't jive with that, too bad. And it doesn't mm -hmm. impact you even as, as it would have right prior to like this shift in the psyche. <laughs> and thank you for answering the question because I actually had a viewer question, which I will put in, in post, um, because she didn't get to send it to me on time, but from at Lana RK 11. And her question was, how do you respond to people on social who don't agree with you? So you gave a beautiful answer. I've also experienced similar with, uh, believe it or not, hurricanes and flooding and like severe weather, people get upset about that stuff <laughs> when the hurricane doesn't hit. And I'm like, I, okay. And same as you, you right? You gotta just, okay, go from that place of, okay, um, what do I know? Who am I? Um, who do I want to be on social and in my real life, right? And come back with that kindness and understanding. And, you know, thank you so much for your, your comment. Um, you know, I'm so thankful that now we are able to actually see hurricanes when they come. Can you believe what that must have been like, um, you know, before this technology was invented that a hurricane would just hit? Now we are so lucky to have people like the National Weather Service working around the clock for us to keep us safe. And, you know, you go there and same thing. Then you start to get back from them. Oh, I didn't really think of it that way. And thank you for, you know, being kind and you know what I mean? And, and apologizing for the way that they acted because they were really being, you know, <laughs> what about you, mm -hmm. Melissa? And, and this will be our last question, which wraps us up. I feel like I kind of experienced a similar shift too, um, because before in the height of COVID, which is when I started like really co creating content and things, um, I had a lot of time on my hands, you know, and so I would be fighting back and forth with people in the comments, like, you know, and at some point I started to realize like, sometimes I just argue with people because I want to win an argument and, you know, whether or not I like, I, I mean, I feel like I was always in the right, obviously, but you know, like I was like, okay, well, how is this really conducive to like um, change, effective change? And, you know, I was like, it really isn't. And it would get me in a really bad head space. You know, like I would just be really frustrated. And sometimes that would, you know, translate into my life. Like, you know, cause I just be really frustrated and tell my, my Connie, like, I, I don't want to deal with it right now. I just want to sit in the room and like, you know, like fight with people that I'm never, I don't know who these people are. Sometimes they're blank profiles. And really, is it worth my time? Because then it was eating into my time with my children um, and with my family. And sometimes I would just be put in a bad mood for the rest of the day. Um, after a while, like, I was like, you know what? Like so half of this stuff, more than half of this stuff can be left. Like, you know, especially if they're really nasty comments that it's coming from people who really don't want to change their mind. They just want to have that effect on you and start, you know, get an argument out of you. Um, and then you start to recognize when this is happening. But whenever I would come across a comment that would be offensive and still offended me, but maybe, you know, these people just, they're ignorant. They don't know better. So they're coming across like, oh, like one comment I would get a lot, but don't you guys need tourism anyway? Wouldn't you guys like, wouldn't your whole economy fail? Wouldn't you guys basically be like, you know, whatever. And I'd be like, and I'd go back and I'd comment like, you know, yes, tourism is a large part of our economy, but you know, that would just provide us the opportunity to diversify, invest in our agricultural, you know, industry. And, you know, we need more sustainable farms rather than more Airbnbs, rather than more, vacation rentals rather than you know cash crop agricultural farms or more high rises and you know things like that so sometimes I would go back and be like hey you know I'd go in calmly patiently try and you know just educate you know in a more non-confront confrontational or aggressive way um but yeah like sometimes like I'll be honest sometimes I still do get a little irritated and I'm like ah, you're ignorant, go outside, touch, touch some grass, like, whatever, like, you know, something like that, but, like, you know, 
it still we're comes out of you here and there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. just like Kimmy, you were saying, like, you know, day to day, like things may change because we're human, right? One day I might wake up, I see a comment. I'm like, you know what? I have the time today. I'm not going to be patient. And some days I wake up and I'm like, you know what? Like, it's okay. Let it go. And I'm still, I'm still learning, you know, navigating through that. But um, generally, if somebody, if somebody disagrees with me and I feel like, you know, they're coming, they're not coming out of a place of just purely wanting to offend and hurt, then I will try and do what I can to, you know, try and come to some common ground, you know, hey, by the way, like, you know, yeah, you think that, but this is why I said, I said what I said, this is what I mean, this is what I feel. And usually sometimes people, a lot of times people are like, oh, you know what, I never knew that, you know, they don't want to argue back. They're like, you know, thank you. Thank you for showing me patience or showing me grace. And it's like, yeah, no, like, and then it makes me feel better. Those, those interactions are always more um, fulfilling or gratifying in a way, because you know, I could have turned this into like a really heated thing and we would have just been going back and forth and no ground would have been made like anywhere other than me being irritated and this other person probably being irritated wherever they're sitting on their phone screens, you know, just like I am. No, what? 100%. I totally agree. I, I'm thinking about the spiral of silence and how people are afraid sometimes to to stand up for what they believe in, yet there are so many people that will write that hateful comment, uh, mm -hmm. expressing their very strong opinion about something. <laughs> and I don't know, that just struck me as I'm listening to you both. <laughs> no, totally. And I, I mean, I feel like it's been like this interesting evolution of how I handle negative comments, because like I said, at first, I would do everything in my power to smash them. And, um, and it was the same exact thing where like my husband then boyfriend could always tell when I was dealing with that because of my body language and because of my lack of uh, interaction with him. I, do, I just would be irritated. And so it would affect the way I would treat people I love around me because I'd be like doing this silent fight, you know? And then worst of all though, like I would smash them so hard that sometimes they would delete their profiles. And then I would just end up thinking like, does that really create good change? Then I went to the full, like, I'm not going to call it the guru stage, but like where I really <laughs> would try and like give everybody love and respond out of respect <laughs> and, um, and, you know, thank them for their comment and, and speak from my heart vulnerably about why I do what I do. And that was amazing. And definitely I saw the positive change in that, but I can't say like, that's how we're supposed to do it. Like, that's a lot of work. You know, and one thing mm -hmm. I also noticed with that, just to say that that's a really, that was a really good effect that I saw, but I also had to question myself and say, how is it though, Kimmy, you got like 140 positive comments giving you love. You never responded to one of them. And then this one person who comes up like, you know, guns a blazing, you're going to give them all that love and attention. Like there also was something that felt a little backwards about that. Like, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then when I was pregnant, I this was just like, no, I am just going to delete these negative comments because I don't want any toxic energy around me or my baby. So it's like, it was forever changing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think there's a real necessarily set answer that I have, but I think that everything that to take in account um, when you get a negative comment is just what's worth it. And some and that's going to change every day. Sometimes, sometimes the goal or the movement's worth it. Sometimes your own personal well-being is worth it, you know, and sometimes just delete that and move on, you know, mm -hmm. like, well, yeah. both of you have hundreds of thousands of followers. So it is, it literally is, it's like a whole day job. Like it's a full-time job to mm -hmm. reply to all of these, um, you know, comments, good and bad, right? Because you do want to engage with your following, especially when you represent something or if it's something that's really um, important to you and you are trying to go for collective action, right? Um, a couple of things that popped into my head, just listening to you both, with um, anyone who's thinking about putting out, you know, this type of whatever you believe in, right, content, 
on your profiles, but you're worried about the spiral of silence and you know, you're fearful of posting it because of the criticism. A couple of things. Um, number one, what I'm hearing from both of you is like that practice of compassion with treating others that clearly like something's going on with them <laughs> for them mm -hmm. to have to spew like such hateful things because there are other ways of expressing your opinions that aren't in line with someone else's opinions that can lead to a constructive conversation and communication. But clearly, if something is triggering us in that way, it's because of the way it's being said as well, right? And so that practice of compassion can be um, something that's quite fulfilling for for you as the person who created the content that, you know, by responding as the guru, as Kimmy said, you know, you're, you're going through this practice that really helps with massaging your soul and who you are and who you want to be and all of that. So, you know, I, I like that side of it. And then there's like the practical side that there are tools on social media that you can use. So for example, on Instagram, um, I have my settings so that only people who follow me can comment. And that mm -hmm. pretty much got rid. I don't have a following like you guys. So, you know, it, it worked for me because I I'm on another level <laughs> down here, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, by doing that, I didn't get like the trolley ones, you know, or like the weird, I'm like, what, where did this come from? I, I don't need these, this energy, these people that, you know, don't even follow me because that is one of the beautiful things about social media is that people actually have to push the button and they have to go, I want <laughs> to follow mm -hmm. this person. So some part of them, right? Like wants to be a part of your life. And so when you cut off all the people that are just trying to, you know, like they don't even follow you, they don't care, you know, whatever, then they can't comment. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, a good idea. Mm -hmm. Just a little couple tidbits. All right, I'm going to button up here. So, okay. So to button up our time here, the research-based strategies that were shared by Dr. Hawkins were media literacy. Like we really need to think critically about what we consume online and who to believe. Becoming active social media users rather than passive consumers was another point he made. And engage with pro-social collective action by sharing, liking, commenting, donating. You matter. Your actions matter and realize that your voice matters. So ladies, any last things that you'd like to share before we go? Um, I think I would just say like for especially the younger generations, like if there's something that you truly believe about, use your voice, use social media, even if you don't have a platform, I think every thing that you can do that you are able to do has an impact. Um, and, you know, what, even if you think like, oh, if I just sign, I'm just one signature on a petition, I think you know, every little thing counts if you are moving toward, um, if you're helping the movement that and the causes that you really truly care about. It's just the introduction, you know, signing a petition today and five years later, you know, you're going to be a member in house, you know, pushing for bills that will help support causes that you make, you know, um, never think that you're doing, never think that what you're doing has doesn't have a meaning. I guess. Yeah. I would, I would kind of have to echo that and just say that I think social media can be an intimidating platform to be your true authentic self. Um, but it is so important that, that you don't shy away from that. Um, I think that it's a place where we can want to it can kind of sometimes make us feel this pressure to fit in and to have our posts or ourselves or our bodies or our beliefs or whatever it is look like the next person next to us. But I don't believe that that's the answer. I believe that diversity is the most beautiful thing in the whole wide world. And so if you have something to say, or if you believe in something, or if you just being you is different then the person next to you, good for you. Like, like own that and know that we need more of that in this world. And even if it isn't measurable, like the other people you're looking at, even if it isn't as popular, you know, even if it never leads to these movements, like you're doing your job, 
just by being you and that that's what this world needs and that's what we all need it's not about fitting in it's about a sense of belonging and the more that there's so many of us all different in our own unique beautiful ways like sharing this world together I mean that's the kind of world I want to live in not a monochromatic blah one <laughs> 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 oh, I love these episodes because of how we're able to see how that academic knowledge really relates to real life. So thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing with us today on the podcast. I'm sure that our listeners just start drinking it all in. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you both. This has been really yeah. uplifting. I can't even explain. I really feel privileged to be a part of this conversation. Oh, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I always get nervous because my podcast is different, right? Like I'm like telling you to do work. <laughs> I'm like, you have to listen to this. You have to do that. And then we're going to talk. <laughs> Here's all the things we're going to talk about. It's like, you know, very cerebral, but at the same time, I, I, I just, I love it so much. And I'm so happy that that you both enjoyed that because I did so much. And, um, I think that's why the listeners really resonate, you know, with it is because it's, it's so thoughtful. And so, I don't know, it's just like gets your juices flowing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I love our own little, like, I love this little collective of the three of us and our own little differences. And like, Malika, yeah. you're just like, I don't know. I just love everyone's different strengths and like, um, <laughs> and seeing it all come together. So good you guys job. are the best. Both of you. Beautification of communication, the communication podcast. Again, again. Bye.